mode. Good afternoon. Welcome to Cloud Foundry vs. Docker vs. Kubernetes with Sufyan Kazi. Before I hand over, just a brief note on eSynergy solutions. eSynergy specialise in open source and cloud resourcing. If you're looking for a new opportunity or to build out your team, please get in touch after the webinar. Now, moving on to some housekeeping. If you have any questions for Sufyan, please fire them over via the question box throughout and Sufyan will answer them at the end of his talk. We are recording the session and the slides and recordings will be made available and sent to you tomorrow by email along with my contact details. Now I'm going to pass over to Safian to begin the talk. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Thanks, eSynergy, for allowing me this chance to present to you today. It's really, um, I'm really glad to have this opportunity and I really hope that you guys enjoy what we're going to offer. Hopefully, with a bit of luck, you can all see a big pivotal logo on the green background. Uh, let's get on with today's talk. So, what are we doing? So today's talk is Cloud Foundry versus Kubernetes versus Docker. Let's get on. Let's explain a bit about Pivotal and the company I work for. First of all, just um, discussing this. Pivotal has been around for a couple of years now. We focus in three different areas. We have a division known as Pivotal Labs, which help companies become more agile by working with them to uh, work on develop software in an agile way, teach them our techniques, and teach them how to develop software in a better way. Uh, we also look at Pivotal Big Data Suite. It's an uh, offering from ours including real-time in-memory data grid products, a, um, a in-memory, sorry, a massively parallel batch processing product called Green Plum as well, and a lot of our products now are now uh, incubating on Apache. You can find them as Apache Geode and Apache uh, Green Plum. Um, we also have a Cloud Foundry, which is going to be the bulk of today's discussion, uh, covering our cloud uh, abstraction layer product, uh, which I really want to get into now. But if you want to find out a bit more about Pivotal, I do recommend you going onto our YouTube channel. Um, just took a screenshot I grabbed yesterday. You can see there's videos from Cornelia talking about diversity uh, in, our, in Pivotal. We've got Onzi, our lead engineer, talking about the op how they're building Cloud Foundry, the future. Uh, we've got Pivots talking about what it is to what it's like to work here and what their experiences are. Um, if you don't know, if you're familiar with the Spring framework for Java, Pivotal are the custodians of Spring, so all the people who make the great Spring stuff are Pivotal employees, and recently we uh, had the pleasure of running and hosting the Spring One platform conference. All of our uh, presentations from that are now slowly being released to YouTube on our YouTube channel, so if you click on that section, you'll see videos from customers uh, such as banks, such as healthcare companies, talking about what they've done with Pivotal, their experiences, um, and how that's gone for them. Me, uh, so my name's Sufian Kazi. Um, uh, a lot of people call me Suf, because uh, it's only got three letters, which makes it a lot easier. Tweet me, email me, contact me as, as you need. Let's get into today's talk. Cloud Foundry versus Docker versus Kubernetes. That's the title I came up with when I was asked to give this webinar. And to be honest, I don't like this title. And I don't like this title because it's got the word versus in it. And I don't think there is a versus. I don't think Cloud Foundry is a choice of either or. Um, in fact, very often you may want to use Docker, you may want to use Kubernetes, you may want to use Cloud Foundry. It depends on your use case. We work uh, close, closely with uh, these technologies. Well, I'm a big fan of them personally myself, and I don't think there should be any division or um, choices. It's more about what you want. So the answer may be Kubernetes, the answer may be Docker, the, may be, the answer may be Cloud Foundry, but what is the question? Now, when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, um, let's imagine a scenario where we work for a company that produces some product, whether it's a service or a physical real product that and the, and the aim of this company obviously is to make money or to become profitable and the way this typically happens is there's a boffin who sort of says hey I've got an absolutely brilliant idea and in order to maximize that idea to get some revenue the company says well we need to produce stuff we need to produce those ideas so they form a production line production line 
automated process of developing and creating that product. It's a sequence of events, it's people contributing to make that product and we can all go out there uh, and consume it. Now, this particular picture I'm showing here, I think there's a problem, obviously it's a very old production line. Most production lines nowadays look something like this. Uh, they're a bit more automated as far as people in there. There's and, and the reason of why I think companies have shifted this way is because it reduces errors, increases speed, uh, improves consistency. These are all advantage, advantages to a company in how it can produce its products. Companies don't go down this route because they don't like people. It's not because they want to make them obsolete. It's because there's much more efficient uses for what we can do. Computers can do the boring, mundane stuff. We could focus on marketing a product. We could focus on selling a product. We could focus on experiencing, asking people what, what how, how they enjoyed it, etc. We can maybe focus on managing and operating the machines. So coming back to this idea, I'm not working for a product company, I work for a software company and I've always been doing that for quite a while. And there's been various types of, let's say, uh, production line that I've been involved with. I think the classic one that we all know is obviously the waterfall, it's something I used a lot in my early days as a software engineer. And I think it's definitely been superseded by a lot of companies who are going down a more agile methodology, who want to do things more uh, along a continuous delivery uh, sort of ideal where they can release something small, rapidly, quickly, continuously iterate and continuously improve. Now, I've worked in companies who've gone through the change from waterfall to agile and typically some of the problems we come up with is that same Buffett I mentioned before obviously comes along to us and says, here's my idea and we start to get busy working on this amazing bit of software and then they come along and say, wow, our competition have released that idea already. How did that happen and why weren't we first? And I think, well, we've started implementing these agile methods. They must have speed us, sped us up. So what's the problem? In my experience, I'm not saying it's possibly your experience, but definitely in some of the companies I've worked for, uh, the problem I had is a brick wall. Um, well, in reality, it wasn't a brick wall. It was more of a sort of a cobble wall. The wall was gnarly at the edges, a bit sort of gruesome to look at, it was a bit complicated, there was no structure, there was no order. And I'm using definitely my experience here, this was typically a team of people at the companies I worked at who weren't agile. Uh, unfortunately for me, these were my IT operations team. Now I'm definitely not saying that all operations teams don't think in an agile way, but in my case, several years ago, that was the case. So I needed to circumvent them, I needed to go past their idea of raising tickets and doing things in a sort of prescribed way which didn't always work. Um, what actually happened was typically is if we look at this curve at the bottom was this curve I think kind of represents the effort and the impact and cost of delivering software over time and I was involved at this first stage, you know, the first two green lines. I was involved in the initial hub of creating and releasing that first big bang solution and whether I was doing it in an agile way or a more waterfall traditional way, there was always this huge uh, focus of effort and then something went live. And then it really was behind that wall. It wasn't really my problem, but however, the people who were running my solution, they were still looking after it. And their effort and over time just increased and increased and increased. They had to think about updating the system, they had to think about handling change, problems I didn't really anticipate or plan for when I built that original piece of code. So the real cost or an effort of kind of building software is measured not just the point of going live, it's the point of going live and supporting it thereafter. So coming back to our original idea, our Boffin who had this idea, um, what I kind of went down the road of doing a while ago was using a thing called containers. Containers are great. If I could build the environment that my software needs to run in, I could package it and I could give it to my non-agile operations team and they could just run it. But often I was faced with problems. Um, should it really be me building the container? They didn't really trust what I was packaging. What was I running in that container? What port was it taking? And I was kind of creating dependencies now. I was sort of saying, well, the definition of this container is locked to version one of my application. So I needed to build some kind of relationship with source control or somewhere to say, hey, 
uh, only run this app with this container definition. And we always needed to find a way of scheduling that workload. Uh, I needed to explain what was in the container. And it didn't stop there. I, didn't need to, I wasn't thinking of the bigger picture. My container, where my application was running, needed to talk to other containers, where other apps and other services were running. Where were those containers? What were their IP addresses? What languages? What protocols did they speak? Um, what did I need in my container in order to talk to the versions of software in other containers? Did I need a specific database driver? Did I need to update my container? Problems, again, that are in the latter half of that effort curve, which I never dealt with in the past because it was over the wall. But I've kind of now taken some of that responsibility on by creating this container. So I need to think about this. So although I, I did do some automation, how automated was I? Which production line was I on? Was I on the sort of older production line or a more sophisticated modern production line. Now, over time, I then learned that just containers isn't enough. I needed to blend in something called DevOps. I needed to add some kind of additional support and functionality around my containers. And pretty much my story of DevOps really follows this recipe. I would take a container, I would then some add some scripting stuff around it from various different vendors. I then think of some kind of way of scheduling my containers and could be using Kubernetes, could be Mesos, and they're all perfectly fine technologies. It gets really messy then when I have to think about the network, you know, what are the IP addresses and how do things talk to each other. Then it gets really freaky and awkward when I need to talk to IT security. They said I could take my um, container and I could put it inside another container and put it inside another container and obfuscate and kind of hide things and do some weird stuff just in case someone could hack around. And really what I thought was a perfect architecture really kind of was beginning to break at the seams. And again, I was only thinking about an initial point of here's my bit of effort and my effort is about getting some first point of being live. If I needed to re-release this bit of software and, re re and run this process again, there was always this cycle which I never saw, which is, okay, what about your operating system that needed updating? What about the drivers that needed updating, the libraries? There's this bigger picture out there that I wasn't really solving by going down a container and DevOps route only. Um, so again, which production line was I building? Now, to be honest, for some people, for yourself, the first production line may be more than enough. For some of the companies I'm dealing with now in my current job, the production line that they need in order to be competitive, to stay ahead of the competition in their business, is the bottom production line to do as much automated work as possible and they allow the developers to focus on building code and the operations team to run and operate the production line. I think we're just doing containers and DevOps. I'm kind of gearing more towards the top production line, not quite fully automated. This problem gets compounded even more when I look at how I was building software and how that adapted over time. To begin with, I used to build something called a monolith, and I kind of evolved more towards a microservices-based approach. And when I think about microservices, I'm always reminded of this talk Kent Beck gave uh, quite a while ago. Kent Beck, if you don't know him, uh, wrote a book called Extreme Programming, which we're quite fond of here at Pivotal. And he talked about the idea of connected software and modular software, and what impact these design choices had over time to the cost of adding new features to your software. I think it's accepted now that every uh, organization now, the first version of your software always needs adapting and modifying. And what he advocated was begin in a connected mode. If you begin in a connected mode, you're, because you're able to achieve speed and velocity much faster because you're evolving, you're building bits and pieces, you don't know how they interact, you don't know which bits need which. You can operate at much better speed if everything is kind of just close to each other. Over time, though, you need to switch to a modular approach. You need to break things up. As things become more specialized, that allows you to eliminate you know, um, hard coding and integration patterns which restrict your ability to change and adapt and add new features. The problem is, is that if, if, this is the pro if this is a curve over time, the effect of cost and, and impact and effort over time of one piece of software, what am I doing now by breaking things into smaller chunks? I'm actually creating loads of these curves for individual bits of software. I'm really exacerbating the problem even more. And I really need to think about this. I really need to think, 
which production line do I want? Especially if I'm going for this bottom style of releasing software, the agile style, I need to think about a better way of releasing and handling that ability to change. In fact, more so um, in the approach I was doing, I may be building code in an agile way, I may be using containers and a bit of DevOps, but there's always change, whether it's change in what the software needs to do, or change because where my software is running, it needs to be updated, to patched, etc. Someone needs to manage all of this and someone needs to think about this. And again, I don't think DevOps is the only answer, whether it's that's just pure scripting, etc. So let's come back to the theme here. We were looking at three different technologies, Cloud Foundry, Docker, and Kubernetes. And I think what I can do, or my strength is at least, is to show you a little bit about Cloud Foundry. So I'd like to do a bit of a demo um, uh, on this webinar. So for those of you who have never seen Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry uh, is an open source technology. What I'm about to show you today is Pivotal's enterprise flavor of Cloud Foundry, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Uh, we write the bulk of the open source distribution. This is our enterprise layer on top of it. And the first user interface I'm going to show you is what we call our Ops Manager. And this is a user interface which we expect the operator who's running the Cloud Foundry platform to interact with. And we, in this user inter interface, you can see these several boxes which we call uh, tiles. And each tile is clickable and allows an operator to configure the platform. And for those of you who don't know, who, cloud, who don't know anything about Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry is an abstraction layer designed to sit above your cloud, whether that's a cloud on-premises, for example, using vSphere or OpenStack, or a public cloud, you say Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Compute Engine. And the operator really does a one-off activity to connect Cloud Foundry to that cloud layer. And then they can configure all the different technologies and features and they can add more products to Cloud Foundry as needed. So in this particular Cloud Foundry, I'm uh, operating it for a team of developers who need a Jenkins platform. And I'm going to run that on Cloud Foundry. They need Redis, they need MapMQ, they need MySQL, they need some real-time metrics. And there's additional capabilities you can add to extend and, and, and um, leverage Cloud Foundry uh, beyond its basic uh, functionality. And each of these tiles is clickable. So for example, as an operator, I can click on this tile and it allows me to see more detail about how my Jenkins cluster is configured, how much resource I'm assigning, and it's the same practice for each of those tiles. I don't want to spend too much time in the operations view. I want to sort of give you the experience of how a developer uses Cloud Foundry. So in my demo today, I've got a simple application called Cities, Cities Service. It's written in Java, it's using the Spring Framework, specifically Spring Boot, and I chose Spring Boot because it just makes life really easy and quick uh, for me, uh, kind of simplifies one of my work. The application is fairly simplistic. It's going to talk to a database, and inside that database is lots of information about cities, hence the name of the app. And the purpose of the app is to expose a RESTful endpoint uh, slash cities, which when someone hits that endpoint, it returns geographical data in HATIOS format. So it allows people to navigate between different cities, it allows them to get, get raw data about uh, postcode, URL, latitude, longitude. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to deploy this application to Cloud Foundry, and just to give you an idea of the experience um, of doing so. Now, normally this would be a real automated pipeline, uh, production line, like I described before, and I'm gonna show you one of those in a few moments. But let's keep things basic for a moment and keep it manual. I'm gonna use a command line. I've installed the Cloud Foundry CLI, which allows me to run a CF command, and other commands like CF target, as you can see. And this is showing me that I'm connected to that Cloud Foundry instance, which is running on vSphere as a specific user uh, and uh, space, an organ space. So a couple of things to observe here. Cloud Foundry, beyond just having containers and orchestration, it's controlling who is allowed to do what. So it's got built-in user authentication. So this is the web view that the developer sees, our Apps Manager. Now, this is the same environment I'm going to deploy my app to. I'm logged in and it's saying that I belong to an organization. I may belong to multiple organizations. And inside that org, I have different spaces which I can push code to. A space really is an environment where I want to run code. I could have a dev space, test space, or there to could be arbitrarily labeled based on functional area. It allows me to kind of validate and prove my code. 
and as a developer I also have something to a marketplace and a marketplace shows me what my operator has made available to me so in my case I know my app needs a database so I can run the marketplace command here from the command line and it's asking Cloudfront, hey what market what services are available to me when that list comes back it's going to show me uh, all the services which have been pre-configured and I can ask a more specific question say tell me about uh, MySQL I want to use MySQL because I need a database in my app now for each plan there so, so for each service there are plans in this case there's one particular plan so as a developer I need to know how to connect to MySQL and the Cloud Foundry the process is fairly simple I say CF create service uh, of type p-mysql of plan 100 megabyte dash dev and then I just give that service instance a name like so. At no point in time do I need to know where that JWC, where that uh, MySQL service is running, the credentials and URL. I'm protected from having to know which makes my life easier because my code is then not hard coded or configured to, to to run on one particular JD, one particular database server. In fact, as my code moves from dev to test and different spaces, I can just get it to talk to my DB. And my DB will automatically be set up correctly for me. Then as a developer, I need to deploy my code and the command to deploy in Cloud Foundry is very simple. It's CF push and I can add parameters like give me one copy, give me a certain amount of memory and so on. To make life easy for me, I've got a manifest file which has just got some of that information for me. So you can see I know ahead of time that I need to connect to a service called MyDB. So I've got that label in there. I've got a name of my app, how much memory, how many copies, and where my application is located. I've already built this app and constructed a jar file. So if I had to run the command CF push, that's going to trigger off a sequence of events. It's going to read the manifest file. It's going to connect to Cloud Foundry, to my org, to my space. And it's going to start uploading my code and deploying a root and create and deploying the app and it's going to create a root for me which is a way to access my app. So it's configuring the network for me, it's configuring the OS for me, it's and it's, it's configuring the runtime environment for me, pretty much all from one command. It's, it's even not making any assumptions as a type of application. And as you can see there are many types of application that you could push to this Cloud Foundry. Different languages, it doesn't just have to be Java. And while that's going on in the background, we can flip back to the console and we can see where there was nothing, there's now a placeholder for an app called City Service. And if I were to click into this, I can see the app is coming up slowly, uh, it's configuring the environment, and there's various different tabs along here. If I click on Services, I can see that it's connected my app to MyDB. Here, if I wanted to, I could see the credentials and the URL but I didn't need to write any hard code any of that in my code. I just needed to, hard to effectively create a uh, reference to my label. And the way my application is going to consume that data is that what Cloud Foundry is going to do is going to create a variable, environment variable on the container called VCAP underscore services. And inside that variable there's going to be uh, the credentials which my application can read. The great thing is because I'm using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, I didn't even need to write that code for me. But Spring Boot and Spring Cloud are going to read and parse those variables automatically, so my, light, my footprint is really light. So now, again, just to recap the experience here as a developer, I built some functionality and I just said push. As soon as I said push, about two minutes later, my app is up and running. Uh, I'm using an environment here that doesn't have SSL certificates, so I'm just going to accept these warnings. My app is there. It's publicly available now. Any of you who are using the webinar can hit the application. I can start testing the functionality. Hey, show me all the cities. It's talking to my database. I can start doing some searches because um, that's the way my application is written. And I can say, hey, show me um, all the cities where they contain um, um, you know, a certain thing like ALD. And that's going to show me all, that, uh, all the cities containing ALD. Great. I built my code, deployed it, and it ran for me on the cloud. Um, so if we just walk through that in a bit more detail, what just happened? Well, definitely Cloud Foundry is using, using containers. It's not using Docker container. It's using our own container technology. Containers have been around for a long time. They, they even predate this slide. They go back as far back as Solaris zones. 
Uh, you, what CloudFound is using is our own container technology called Garden, but fairly soon we're going to open that up to, to run any container call that supports the Open Container Initiative uh, format. Because I'm using Cloud Foundry, I can do the same push steps on any um, IaaS layer, whether that's Google Compute, Amazon, Azure, OpenStack, or VMware, as I mentioned before. And a couple of things happened while I did this process. The first thing that happened was um, that within Cloud Foundry, something called build packs were, active, were, in, were consulted. Hey, are you the right build pack for this app? No, I'm not. Are you the right build pack for this app? Yes, I am. So dynamically, if I were to change the, line, the behavior of my application tomorrow to another language, I wouldn't have to advise Cloud Foundry. I could just say push. It would work that out for me. And when the build pack was triggered, each build pack went through a sequence of steps which says, okay, what are the libraries you need? And if we flip back to my uh, UI here, we can see some of that sort of action and process. So it's seeing that um, it needs Java, so it fetched JDK. It's uh, stored it needed Tomcat. It's sort of installed that for me automatically and it's brought my application up and running. And all these steps are in our build packs, which are, by the way, on GitHub and publicly available, and you can customize them if you need to, to do something specific. The range of build packs we have, they cover, obviously, the Java language, as you've seen, and related frameworks. They cover Ruby, Rails, they cover Python, they cover Node.js, they cover PHP, they cover Golang, and recent, most recently, they cover .NET as well, giving you the same uh, um, functionality just for different languages and we want to continue to extend and adapt and grow this list of frameworks. So if we're comparing say just going down a Docker route and again remember I use Docker quite regularly, I'm a big fan of it. I'm just saying for my use case if I went down the Cloud Foundry route I've saved a lot of time here. I didn't have to bring my own runtime image, I didn't have to um, version control what the configuration in source control with my code. They say here's my app, can you run it for me? If we go into a bit more detail here to see what happened behind the scenes, when I did the push, um, several components that were in Cloud Foundry were activated. And they're running uh, already ahead of time. And some of these sort of overlap with, I guess you could say, some of the functionality of Kubernetes. So how do I schedule this workload and how do I find somewhere for it to run? Well, these components um, start having a conversation, which eventually leads to the need to run an auction. We need to choose somewhere for this application to run. And the auction talks to a bunch of pre-configured cells. These could be Amazon instances, virtual machines, OpenStack machines, etc. Those cells will report back to say, I've got this much workload, you know, I'm suitable, I'm not suitable, and the auctioneer makes a decision and then says, okay, I'm going to choose you and I'd like you to construct a container for me in real time now. I'd like you to then trigger this build pack, take these libraries and run that on the container for you. And then, as you saw in my case, in about two minutes, my application was running on an OS with all of its libraries, and immediately I could access that application uh, via its URL. That's great because then it was fuss-free fuss -free, um, uh, in this situation for me. It just made my life a lot easier. The great thing about Cloud Foundry is it's not just about getting your application running. It's about looking after your application after it's running. So here in this case here, we can see what would happen if in the cloud world, somewhere your, under, your underlying infrastructure suffered some kind of outage. Maybe the container died, maybe something inside the container, like one of the JVM processes, Tomcat died. Maybe the whole machine where all your containers are running died. So Cloud Foundry has several layers of HA built in, about four layers in total. And there's a constant sort of communication going on behind the scenes. The communication is, well, when they push the application, they say they would like this certain state. Uh, what is the actual state? And if the actual state differs, then Cloud Foundry will rectify the situation. So here, if the cell were to die, it would update the router to say, hey, don't expose that path at the moment. Then it would trigger a sequence of events, which would be to correct the situation, run another auction, and this time a different cell may be the most appropriate to run our workload, deploy the container to there as well, and then restore the root to the application. So Cloud Foundry is a great place for you to host and run apps, not just to get them up and ready and running, but to manage and maintain them once they're running and keep them running. So if you look at it 
um, in as a bigger picture, you know, there are parallels, I think, between Docker and parallels between Kubernetes. But the thing what Cloud Foundry is doing is doing a lot more for my application if I need this and this is my use case. So uh, let's look at one of these, CF scaling. Um, I could do commands like, hey, scale my app and give me two more copies. So give me, in total, three copies. That's going to trigger a request, again, to the auctioneer to find two more cells, which are free, and to um, then find, uh, construct containers on them and then deploy the application which it already knows. So as we, if we do a query here, we can see that actually now there's one already running, but two more starting. And I've done this manually. What Cloud Foundry also has, obviously, is the ability to do this automatically, to scale up and scale down depending on workload. We saw that before that there's um, authentication, so you can apply rules uh, on how users, different users can access different spaces and different orgs. You can do uh, isolation to control what parts of the system that people can, can access and they can't access. All the logs for all the running instances of, the, of each application come to a centralized place. So I can issue a command like, hey, show me all the logs. And it's streaming it to one place, which I can then forward to maybe Splunk or some other logging system like ELK or whichever takes your fancy. Cloud Foundry can also do some built-in APM or you leverage uh, other APM providers. As you saw, it's got health management. And we can do blue-green deployment. So if I, again, if I go back to my application, my app is running, it's live, and it's reachable at a specific route. But I can add multiple routes. I can add a route here to say, hey, um, cities-v1 to my app, to my application. So now there are two URLs, public URLs, which I can access my application by. Now if I think about this, what this means is I can push my application to Cloud Foundry and say, hey, give it a version 1 URL to begin with. And it's running in a production space, but it's not live. Because no one outside of my company knows this URL. It's internal only. And I can run some tests, validate it's OK, scale it up to the workload I need, and I'm perfect. And then at a later date, I can add an additional route, which is the live route, which is cities service. And then simultaneously, it's got what we can call the production route and an internal development route or a testing route. And this is great because I can then push another version of this app, which has been updated with new functionality. And I can just apply a, new, a route which is dash v2 only. And then at a later date, I can map the public URL to both version 1 and version 2. Therefore, Cloud Foundry is balancing traffic across the two. Then I can remove the public URL from version 1. And there is no downtime to users. There is always either the old service, the new service, or, or just a new service available, which is great. So I think what we've described here is a platform which is fairly comprehensive. In fact, within Pivotal, we like to think of this as the minimal viable platform, which Cloud Foundry just ticks the boxes of quite happily. In fact, Cloud Foundry is doing a lot more than just looking after running your apps. As you saw, you've got a glimpse of, there's loads of other capabilities that Cloud Foundry can do. It can run a CI/CD environment for you. It can run Artifactory Jenkins. It can run your GitLab environment. It can run um, use. It can help you for security by doing SSO um, um, abstraction for your applications. It can give you metrics either with our own PCF metrics component, or can leverage monitoring and logging for your new relic or AppDynamics or you know Elk if you want to. Soon it's going to support different containers. It, currently supports many different IaaS, is. Um, it can support different messaging technologies, and they could be running in Cloud Foundry or outside of Cloud Foundry. So let's explore that idea a moment here. Um, I've currently got my app. It's not the greatest app in the world. It's an app which gives me a list of cities. What I would like to do is deploy another microservice which talks to this microservice. And I'm going to deploy it to a different Cloud Foundry environment. I'm going to deploy it to this one here. And this environment, you can see now, I belong to a different team here, and there's multiple different spaces. And in my space, subspace, there's no app. So if I go back to my command line, I'm just going to flick across to the directory where I've got my other microservice running, which is over here. And I'm going to flick across to my other Cloud Foundry environment. 
So I'm going to log in to a different Cloud Foundry environment, log in to my organization and my space, which is great. And this application here is a user interface. So it's basically the two microservices together form my real application, my functionality. And ultimately, microservices are distributed, right? They are loosely coupled. They, they rely on each other, but they're not uh, tightly coupled in a way as you would have done in the previous days. And to make life simpler, I've got a um, shell script, which I'm going to use. I just need to make a change here. Why do I need to make a change? Well, the way I've written this app is, every time I deploy my backing microservice, I can update the URL here. I've just launched my microservice at this URL, and I deliberately make it use a random word every time, just to make this demo sound, appear more realistic. So since it's running at this URL, I'm going to say this is the URL, your URL you need to connect to. And it's going to construct a service, a user provided service, which basically says, hey, if you're thinking, looking for something called cities, it's URI, is this value here. And so if, I've saved, if I just save that script and run it, it's going to build a code, just to make sure. It's going to delete a previous copy. I don't have a delete previous copy, so it, obviously it's going to stay. There's nothing to delete. It's going to trigger the same sequence of events, I guess you saw before. I'm going to another Cloud Foundry. This is running on Amazon Web Services, not VMware. The, the, the experience for me as a developer is identical. I just need to know how to push the app. It's uploaded my binary uh, bits to the, to the cloud. It's then going to examine my application and say, OK, what kind of application this is? Uh, what libraries does it need? And if I flip across back to the user interface here, we can see what's going on in a bit more detail. So if I hit refresh, uh, I just need to log in again, sorry. Uh, my space, there's an app which is currently being deployed. I have a service. It's not a database service. It's a service which links one microservice to another. And if I look at the configuration, it's showing this is the URL that I use in my shell script. Perfect. And if I go back to the space and see the application, we can flip, flip across to the user. So it's doing the same analysis. It's getting the libraries it needs, that this application needs, and the same behavior would you'd see if it was a, a Ruby app, if it was a .NET app, etc. It's doing this kind of dynamically for me. It's cre creating the containers needed to examine the application, destroying those containers once it's done, finding another container to run the application, deploying that uh, application to that container, deploying the libraries it needs, uh, the runtime environment. And then again, in a matter of minutes, my application is up at this URL. And so what should have happened by now, hopefully, is I've got one microservice running here on my PCF running on Amazon. I've got another microservice here running on my PCF running on vSphere. The vSphere one exposes some basic uh, RESTful endpoints. And the one, one running on Amazon is my web UI. And two of them are going to talk to each other like so. So my web UI queries the other microservice and says, give me a list of cities, takes that data and presents it in a much more user-friendly format. Therefore, I could deploy another microservice, which is more the mobile-friendly format. I could deploy another microservice, which actually embeds this inside its where are my nearest offices or where, is, where can I locate my shops, for example. So this is great. I'm kind of really building some functionality in layers here. Uh, and, and Cloud Foundry made it easy. I could focus just on the functionality again and just deploy without any problems. Now, while that's really good and really useful and clever stuff, what I want to also show while I've got your time in front of you is that's not the only way you can link two microservices on Cloud Foundry. In fact, what Cloud Foundry is really good at is giving you choice and flexibility. You may have noticed before um, on my Cloud Foundry environment running on vSphere, I have a couple of spaces. I have a space called Cities. <coughs> and for those of you who are um, British or familiar with the show with Blue Peter, here's one I made earlier. In this space, I deployed those two microservices again, but I deployed them slightly differently. In this instance here, what I deployed was um, a version of those microservices which leverage some of the Netflix OS design patterns. 
If you're not familiar with Netflix OS, there's a couple of great patterns to handle uh, microservices in a distributed environment. So what happens if all microservices is down? How do microservices discover each other? How do we um, you know, store configuration for microservices in an external place? And in Cloud Foundry, we have uh, something called Spring Cloud Services, which is a service you can deploy in your Cloud Foundry environment, which gives you out of the box access to some of those Netflix components. So in my environment, I have Spring Cloud Services deployed and running. And in this instance that I deployed earlier, I can have pushed my service and my UI, and I bound them to some of the uh, services I need. So here, for example, I'm using the service registry. So let's click on service registry. <coughs> it's showing that there's two microservices bound to each other. And if I click on the manage, uh, I'm sorry, I clicked on the wrong button there. Just go back. If I click on manage of the service registry, I'm presented with a user interface showing me what microservices have registered and what their current state is. So it's showing me that a microservice called city service registered, and this is its URL, and a microservice called city's UI registered, and this is its URL. So the service registry is acting as a sort of a post office library of where microservices can uh, can connect, uh, can register themselves. When each one got deployed, they register and say, hey, this is where I'm running. I could leverage, because I'm using our Spring Cloud Services tool, I could leverage a config server to store my configuration externally, and I can even leverage a circuit breaker, which would say, hey, if this uh, microservice needs to talk to this and it's down, this is the backup to show like a default set of um, cities. And if I click on this, cities UI, and compare and contrast, I've got two copies of this running now, right? I've got the one running in my uh, one cloud file instance, which is using the hard-coded URL, and this one, which is running, which is using service registry, and say, hey, service registry, I need to connect to something called city service. Can you help me out? Can you give me the URL? This is giving me greater separation, greater, much looser coupling between my microservices. It allows me to add new versions of my backing service to scale it up, scale it down, and really, you know, the UI is totally disconnected there anymore. It doesn't need to know um, what, uh, how to talk to those microservices, what to be, which I think is a really powerful feature. So coming back to my slide deck, we've got quite a lot of capabilities built into Cloud Foundry here. It's a place for running your apps, definitely. It's a place for uh, routing and managing and you know, sort of integrating with something like Apigee for looking at how uh, people are accessing your applications. It's a place for adding uh, authorization or uh, delegating out SSO to an external uh, service. It's a place for looking at metrics. It's a place for connecting to uh, provision services either in Cloud Foundry or external to Cloud Foundry. It's a place for uh, changing between cloud providers but not changing the way you deploy and run applications. It's a place for running a CI/CD tool pipeline. It's a place for running a version control system. It's a pretty sophisticated platform. And while I haven't like for like shown the differences between Cloud Foundry here and Docker, or Cloud Foundry here and Kubernetes, I hope what you're seeing is the breadth of functionality shows that if this is your use case and this is what you need, you're a kind of a company that just doesn't want to spend time building all of this yourself. Maybe this is what you want to do from day one. Or maybe you do want to spend time building something, in which case you may might might need, say, Docker, Docker Swarm, Kubernetes. The choice really is yours. They're all great technologies. Now, I've mentioned CI, CD, and pipeline rather, and definitely in my slide deck, I talk about automation. I've done a lot of manual things here. I want to just briefly touch on CI, CD. All you've seen so far today could have been written as a job in Jenkins and GoCD, or even maybe using Concourse, for example, here. Here I've got Concourse, which is a product from Pivotal Open Source, um, and this is my pipeline for deploying my applications here. So each one of these, I can click on these, click on each one, I can see the history of what I did in previous runs. So I've run this a couple of times. If I go back to um, the, the interface, I've got different steps, which allows me to say, monitor my code, when, is it, when it detects a change in my code, trigger these sequence of steps. Create the space if it doesn't exist. Uh, run some preparation. Run some tests on the source code in parallel to make sure that the code is valid and, and needs to be pushed and deployed. 
deploy it to Cloud Foundry and then run some tests to make sure that while it's running on Cloud Foundry, it's exhibiting the results that we need. So now you can fit all this together. Um, and this is really quite interesting, which I'm going to show you in a, in a moment. I want to spend some time just explaining to you the history of Cloud Foundry. It's been going for some time. We've recruited top talent from various different companies to help us on our journey. Um, Cloud Foundry has always been an open source technology, began as a VMware product transferred to us. We've now got a separate body which is governing the, and uh, controlling the direction of Cloud Foundry. And that, that, that body, that foundation, isn't just Pivotal. It's several companies all contributing and, and committing to the direction of Cloud Foundry and where it's going. Pivotal is strongly involved in this. We are now 70% contributors towards the open source code base. The enterprise version you, show, you saw before is built entirely on open source plus enterprise features. We have regular meetups happening uh, globally. In fact, I run a meetup here in London. Please, if you want to join and find out more, uh, come, and, come and visit us at some of our future meetups. We'll be sending these slides out so you have these URLs afterwards. So if I step back and think about what Cloud Foundry gives me and how, what kind of pipeline I'm on, it's really quite interesting. Um, I think what Cloud Foundry is giving me is a much more automated and complete pipeline. When I combine it with a CI CD tool like Concourse, that's when I'm getting true automation. And this is a very interesting thing which I want to draw your attention to. My pipeline, it listens to GitHub and detects changes to my code. But then each individual step uses a Docker container to perform a discrete action, which is finite. So I need to, in my first step, construct a uh, container just to trigger something in Cloud Foundry. So each of these containers is then orchestrating a larger, bigger process, which is running in Cloud Foundry, to do my deployment and creating of my platform. So I think there's a place for every bit of technology, and there's a place for everything and where it makes sense. I call this title at this deck um, Cloud Foundry versus Docker versus Kubernetes. I then said I didn't like that and I think really it should be should I use Cloud Foundry, should I use Docker, should I use Kubernetes, when should I use them, what's the most appropriate place. I think what I am to, concluding nowadays is actually it isn't a choice of technology, it's actually a choice of whether you want a platform as a service or you just want infrastructure or you want maybe infrastructure and a bit more, IaaS++. Plus plus. I think from a time efficiency perspective, PaaS definitely has its merits. And Cloud Foundry is, has, is, a, is a, one of the leading PaaS providers. As you saw from the list of company names on that foundation, there's a lot of people kind of giving it momentum and, and behind it. I'm going to end in a few moments here. I'm going to mention that at the end of my deck, I'm going to provide some useful links uh, which you can look at and find out more. These links will contain some interesting blog posts, um, an overview of the architecture of Cloud Foundry, as well as some kind of core documentation. There's even a single v VM version of uh, Cloud Foundry, um, which you can download from network.pivotal.io. And this is PCF Dev, which is really great. It gives you a small condensed version of Cloud Foundry, which allows you to give, get an understanding of some of the capabilities. If you want to play around with several apps, I'm going to give you your links to the applications I showed you today where you can play around with them, as well as something called Spring Boot Trader, which is a much more complicated and a much more sophisticated example of a distributed microservices application. It's an application, a fictional app for doing fictional stock trades, um, comprised of four microservices. In fact, it's being broken down to five microservices very soon. It uses a full uh, gamut of Netflix OSS components in Cloud Foundry, Config Server, Circuit Breaker. It uses SLU for doing tracing and routing of microservices uh, across uh, of, of, of paths doing across different microservices. It's a really great pro uh, demo built by David Pinto on my team. I also want to mention that we are hiring here at Pivotal. If uh, any of what we've seen today is quite interesting. Um, we have obviously three different product areas, we're hiring in three different uh, areas. If you want to work at labs, we're hiring designers as well as developers and product managers. We're quite a, a diverse organization. Our London office here is in Old Street, but we have offices worldwide now. If you want to work in my team, you feel free, contact us, have a look at this URL. 
At that point, I want to just um, hope that everyone has uh, experienced a good talk and a good demo, and I want to open it up to some questions. If you can use the chat screen, feel free to uh, ask me some questions if you want to know a bit more. Okay. So um, there's a question here about our .NET support and how does that work and does, do we get the same functionality? So it's a very interesting question. I think I, I can explain that in a couple of ways. Um, Pivotal is a company we've been going for a couple of years and we've been fortunate um, as a startup to have had investments from very, from very big organizations. Uh, so currently invested in us is um, EMC and VMware and so by that nature Dell as well. Uh, General Electric have invested in us as well. <clears throat> but also fairly recently there was a round of funding where uh, Ford and Microsoft invested in us. Microsoft are working with us quite closely um, where they um, kind of believe in uh, our product just as VMware does and just as Amazon and Google do as well. And I think they've taken it a bit further. We are working with them to uh, extend our support for Cloud Foundry on Azure. And for that reason we, we added the .NET support. Um, our evolution on .NET is moving at pace. A few months ago, you could push a .NET app, which would run on a Windows machine. And obviously, Windows doesn't support containers. But as .NET Core uh, develops, allowing you to do a bit more uh, containerized stuff, we're going to be adding that to our product. And as um, um, you know, in the same way, we have a Netflix OSS sort of support for. Java applications and other languages. We want to incorporate a project called Steeltoe, which gives similar uh, protection for your microservices for .NET apps. So I hope that answered your question there. I'm going to leave it open if anyone asks, has any other questions. Um, so there's a question here about, again, how do we uh, get hold of uh, Cloud Foundry or who do we talk? Or how do, can we connect and find out more? Um, so if you want to find out more, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to uh, eSynergy as well, we can forward on the, the detail. Uh, I'll flash up my connection, my credentials afterwards at the, at again, uh, at the end. Sorry. Uh, there's a couple of simple websites you need to be aware of. Uh, I showed you um, in our slide uh, where our documentation lives. Another useful website is network.pivotal.io. Uh, Network.pivotal.io is where you can download and try out different bits of Cloud Foundry, either the full-blown Cloud Foundry, which you may want to run on Amazon or vSphere, or the single standalone instance you want to run on your own environment. There's a question here which has come in. Uh, do you consider a Fender Mesosphere? Um, do you consider a Fender Mesosphere and OpenShift Enterprise to be a PaaS offerings in CF space? So OpenShift I consider to be a pass. Uh, we asked Red Hat and OpenShift to join the foundation so that we can work together. At this point in time they haven't um, taken that offer, but it maybe time, time will change. Apprenda I think is definitely working its way towards uh, a pass. Um, I think it's going in a slightly different direction. Um, it's obviously very new to the market, whereas Cloud Foundry has been around for two years, so it's evolved and has added you know features which I think kind of well ahead of the game. Mesosphere, I think, is uh, perhaps a little bit more still at the DCOS level, you know, layer. It's about orchestrating your data center. It gives you OSs and, say, machines, but it doesn't have that, you know, uh, if you think about it from a PaaS perspective, build packs, think about your applications as a currency. Um, and, I, and just coming back on the point about uh, OpenShift, you know, it's, it's focusing more on Docker and Kubernetes. So it's kind of taking more of a container-based focus, whereas I think what we like to do or what we like to think in Cloud Foundry is application is the currency, let us worry about where it needs to run. And I think that's what the value of has is we're monitoring the applications as well as the containers. We're giving the libraries and the application needs, not just a bunch of containers and VMs for you. Um, we have a different question here again, which is how is Pivotal different from AWS? And again, I think, you know, just to kind of re-emphasize that point, there's some great features that AWS offers. It offers containers as a service, it offers you databases as a service, it offers you etc. But again, the ending point for AWS is it's, it's an infrastructure, quite a sophisticated infrastructure, which just says here is somewhere you can run your applications. It doesn't then think of, okay, what, what does your application need? That's where you need your staff. 
So I think it's kind of giving you IaaS and IaaS plus plus. It's not kind of giving you a full gamut of of, um, of you know ease and uh, ease of use. The also interesting point point to pick up is is that there's a danger if you choose one of these providers, like just say maybe going down just AWS route, you may end up writing your apps to leverage Amazon's way of exposing the data of connecting your database only. If you utilize, say, something like a PaaS, you're protecting yourself. You're allowing yourself a flexibility to maybe have Amazon off-prem and something else on-prem, and your applications are not locked into one vendor, whether that's Google. You know, I think there's a place for a PaaS to give you that sort of abstraction layer as well. There's a question here, here about what is your opinion regarding using Pivotal Cloud Foundry with Digital Ocean Platform say for proof of concept purposes, uh, is this possible? Um, so, you know, I'm not sure the cloud only works with DigitalOcean um, uh, out of the box, and I'm not sure how, um, I think maybe we can talk about this offline because I think you're specifically asking about proof of concepts, um, and maybe there's a particular uh, use case you're thinking of here, so we can delve into that a bit more detail. Why don't you reach out to me by email? Uh, question here about how to learn about Pivotal. Do you have any learning links online or on Pivotal website? We definitely have an education team. Um, if you want to know more about our products, I would advise you to go to docs.pivotal.io. All of our products are fairly well documented. If you click on the Cloud Foundry, you've got fairly robust documentation describing the steps to install Cloud Foundry, to use it. You've got a specific section talking about PCF Dev, which is the standalone environment. You've got a section here talking about our build packs, what they are, how do they operate. You can even see the source code for our build packs. As I mentioned, they're all in GitHub. We're a fairly open organization, which allows you to um, you know, understand as much as you can about our product. You can reach out to me directly. Uh, you can also just go onto YouTube, as I mentioned before, and click on our YouTube channel. There's loads of content on there available uh, to help you on your way. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I think um, it's been a real pleasure for me uh, presenting to you today, and I hope you got a lot out of this. I hope there was definitely a lot of food for thought. As I said, you can email me, uh, tweet me, contact me directly or contact eSynergy um, directly after this if you've got much more, any more questions. Uh, it was a great pleasure. Uh, thanks to eSynergy, thanks to all of you for attending. And I think on that point, we can end the webinar and uh, look forward to hearing from you.